are in the midst of a journey through the Word. And as we are in April now, uh, I, last week we talked about the death of Joshua and the end of his life as the leader of the Israelites. I'm skipping over all of Judges, um, and, and not for any real reason. Uh, it, I just completed kind of a study of the book of Judges on Wednesday night. But uh, the book of Judges is a very weird in-between kind of time for the Israelites. They no longer have their key leader, Moses or Joshua, and instead, uh, but, but they yet don't have the monarchs. They don't have uh, Saul and David and Solomon and so forth. So they're in this in-between phase, and they're sort of going on about their business, trying to keep the law, but failing in their faithfulness, and in this cycle of failure, captivity, or oppression, and then liberation through a deliverer that God brings. That's really the story of the judges, and toward the end of that, we, we get into the prophets and to the, to the kings. So today I'm skipping all of that and going straight to Ruth. Now, I'm not really skipping a lot chronologically because the story of Ruth happens during the time of the judges, okay? So, uh, will give me a little bit of leeway there. But the story of Ruth is a beautiful story. And when we read it, we, we sometimes go, well, now, why is that in the Bible? It's a great story about family. It's a great story about faithfulness. Uh, and, and, and it's a great story about some ancestry of David and of Christ. So I think we kind of sometimes assume it's in there because it has to do with David's great-grandmother which is who Ruth was, uh, and thus some lineage as far as the Jewish uh, tradition goes of Christ. But the story of Ruth introduces a concept into Scripture that had, had been there in part before. We see bits and pieces of it to this point. But it's a concept that becomes more clear during the time of the Gospels, in Jesus' ministry, but here in the book of Ruth, in the story of Ruth, we're introduced to this concept. And so I want to look at that this morning. And remember our goal this year as we go through the entire Bible uh, together is to connect all those dots. When we are in the middle of the Old Testament, we want to be mindful of what that means for the New Testament. So Ruth will do the same thing for us this morning. We'll begin in chapter 1 of Ruth, and if you have your Bible, you can turn there, and we'll kind of uh, move through these, uh, these passages and, and this story in kind of a survey fashion uh, as, we, uh, as we look through it this morning. So this is in the days of the judges. Um, there, there is some rabbinical tradition in the Jewish, some of the Jewish manuscripts and the Jewish scholars' writings about Ruth and, uh, and about her origins. So the story is basically that during the time of the judges, there is a woman named Naomi, and she's married to a guy named Imelech. And they are, uh, they're Israelites, but there's a famine, so they leave with their two sons, and they go to Moab. Uh, you may remember Moab, when we read in the Judges about uh, Ehud and Eglon. That was when Moab was the chosen instrument of God to do some, some damage to Israel to remind them of God's faithfulness and remind them to be faithful to God. And so um, Milon and uh, Chilion, their two sons, go with them, and they go to Moab because there's a famine in, uh, in, with Israel and while they're there, um, the two sons take wives, Orpah and Ruth. Uh, they're in that rabbinical tradition, in some of the writings that I was saying, uh, these two are thought to be sisters. And furthermore, there's some of that uh, extra-biblical historical writing that suggests that they might have actually been the daughters of King Eglon. Which would have been, a, if that's true, that's a very interesting story. It's, it makes it a really fascinating story because here's a guy that gets assassinated 
by a, a, a chosen judge of Israel by God, uh, by Ehud. And then his two daughters uh, wind up marrying Naomi's kids. That would be, that's a very fascinating story. Don't know if that's literally true or not, but it is out there in some of the, uh, the writings. So I find that to be somewhat interesting. But these are two Moabite women. They're foreigners. They are not a part of the nation of Israel. They're not a part of God's chosen people. They are outsiders. And what's going on here is one of the things that God has warned against all along, and that is marrying outside of the faith, marrying outside of the family, intermarrying with these foreign nations. But that's what happened, and they're there in Moab for some time to escape the famine. Now, then... Imelech dies, okay? Naomi's uh, husband dies. And um, uh, so, of course, Naomi's a widow. And, and she, she is by herself except for the care of her sons and daughters-in-law. Well, then the sons die. They're there about, they get married and they're, all, they're alive about another 10 years and then they die. So this is already starting out a very sad story. Okay, a woman and her husband or two sons, and they go, and their family grows, they get married, and then everyone dies. That happens in the first five verses. Okay, it's not exactly the greatest start to a story. So now you have these three women, all widowed. These three women now alone. Now, what does it mean to be widowed in this time? Well, there were a lot of rules and a lot of traditions about how to deal with that. Uh, there was the tradition of taking your uh, brother's wife, if your brother died, you took his wife to support her and care for her uh, financially and, and in some other ways. There were also traditions about the, the, the people caring for the widows and the orphans, and that evolves as we get into the New Testament. But for Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, it's a very critical situation. Because for Naomi, she's a foreigner. And for Ruth and Naomi, now they have to consider what their responsibilities are to Naomi. For, for Ruth and Orpah, they have to consider that. And, uh, and, and so, Naomi decides it's time to go back to uh, the land of Israel. Time to go back to my people. She had heard that the famine was over. And so she decides to go and, uh, and to return to her home. So, she departed the place where she was, and her two daughters, this is verse 7, her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Uh, so she urges them to go on. You're still young. You can go find someone else. You can be cared for. You can be taken care of. You can have a life. Uh, beyond this, so go. Now Orpah decides to go. Well within her right, so she takes off. And so it says in verse 14, they lift up their voices, they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and that's to signify that she was saying goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. And then she said, Naomi does, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And then Ruth speaks in verse 16 and 17, as Travis read for us, the famous verse from this, this story. Where you go, I will go. And where you die, I will die. Ruth pledges a loyalty and a commitment to Naomi, even a commitment to serve her God. Ruth speaks the word, you see Lord there, depending on your translation, it may be all capital letters. What that means is that the writers substituted a word for God in that place because she used the formal proper name of God when she spoke. She was talking about Jehovah. So she's serious because to invoke that name is a sacred thing, especially amongst the Jewish people. And so when you see it written that way, when, when Ruth is talking, it means that she is willing to accept the God of Naomi the God of Israel, as her God, and to be with her, to care for her, and to return with her <coughs> to the land she came from. So Ruth and Naomi go back, 
And when they get back, they, they have the, the, the plan is this, because they had holdings. They had land that was uh, the inheritance or by right was the property of her husband, Emily. The problem is that females, women, had, had not, they had no, little to no standing in the culture at the time. And so she couldn't just go down to the county clerk's office and say, that property over there belongs to me. There wasn't a probate court. There wasn't a system in order to transfer the ownership of that property to her so that she could make a living for herself. They've been gone for many years. When she comes back, she doesn't just get to claim that property. She has to have someone to be an advocate for her, to stand up for her, and to claim this property and this inheritance for Naomi in the place of Imelech. That person in the Jewish tradition was known as a redeemer. So Naomi and Ruth go back to their home, or to her home, to Naomi's home, in search of a redeemer. A redeemer because that would be someone who would help you to purchase back or to sell this land that belongs to you. You were going to redeem that land. You had to have somebody to engage in that transaction for you because you didn't have the standing to do it. So that's what Naomi's looking for. So they come back, and, and, and I, most of us are familiar with this story. They come back, and Ruth says, I tell you what, let me go out into the field here, and I'll glean. I'll, I'll get us you know, some food, something to eat. Uh, it was Jewish custom that when you harvested from your fields, you left the corners. Uh, you didn't cut down the corners. You left the wheat in the corner, and that was for the poor and the destitute to come and glean and to get some wheat and some grain for themselves. Uh, that was by design and by law. So she goes out to the field to go behind the ones who are actually harvesting and to pick what she can. Boaz, there's a new character to the story, Boaz, who's a relative of Naomi's, comes through. <coughs> and Ruth is on land that belongs to him. And he sees her. And he says hi, and she says hi. And then he turns to a servant and says, who is this? Who is this woman? Now, he, he might have, you know, thought she was fairly attractive or something about her drew him to her. There was some, some connection there. He wanted to know more about her. So he asked who it is, and, and the servant, knowing the background, knowing the story, told him, that's Ruth. She came with Naomi, and they come back from Moab. And Boaz goes to Ruth, and he says, I tell you what, not only will I let you come glean in my fields, but you go out there with my servants. And you go pick with them and keep that for yourself. And you have all the rights and privileges of somebody from my house. Well, this is great news. Then Ruth goes back and tells Naomi, and they have this little plan of what they're going to do, how they might convince Boaz, because he is a relative of theirs, so he has some duty here, potentially. They're going to convince Boaz to be the redeemer for them. So they're going to, they, they, they kind of get this plan. And it is that Ruth is going to go into his bedroom while he's asleep and lay across his feet. Now, that may not sound uh, like a whole lot to us today, but that was a big deal then. If you went and laid across a guy's feet, you were saying, I'm all yours. And I want to serve you and I want to do whatever you want me to do, you know, if, if, if you'll have me and if you'll take care of me. So she goes and she lays across his, his feet. He wakes up. And that must be a startling thing to go to sleep and wake up with someone laying across your feet. And so he wakes up and says, okay, what's the situation here? Now, it's possible that Ruth was trying to seduce Boaz, you know, for her and Naomi's benefit. And Boaz says, no, don't, you don't have to worry about that. I'll take care of you. But... There's a little technicality here that there's one guy out there who's closer kin to Naomi than Boaz is. So he's got to talk to him first. He's got to go meet him at the city gate and say, you have the right here to take Naomi or take Ruth and sell this property and be her redeemer. And he says, 
I don't, I'm not really interested. So Boaz, you can do it. So Boaz and Ruth are married. And Boaz becomes the redeemer for Naomi and for Ruth in helping, them to, or helping Naomi to secure this property that belonged to her husband. It's an interesting story, and, and it's very interesting by the fact that Ruth and Boaz have uh, Obed, the son named Obed. And Obed uh, has a son named Jesse, and Jesse has a son named David who becomes king. Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David. And she is a great, 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 great something to Jesus in the Jewish tradition. Because she's in the lineage in Scripture. Why does this person have such an important role in the story of God's people? And not only important in that she was part of the family, but important enough to have this story written down and told. <clears throat> when you read this story, it's more than just this is something that happened to Grandma when she was younger. This is more than just a story the family told or a story that was part of the traditions of Israel to understand David or, or something about uh, the background of their monarchy. This is something more. That this woman in the lineage of Christ experienced a relationship with someone that in so many ways mirrors or parallels our relationship with God. And I believe that this story, though serving many purposes, one purpose it serves the Bible reader is as you read through this story, starting in Genesis and working your way through, you come to this after having seen the journey of God's people and seen the struggle of their keeping the law and their wrestling with law and righteousness, and then you come to this story about Ruth. And yes, it tells us how we get from Joshua to David or to Saul and then David, but it tells us more. It, it helps us to understand a concept of redemption. Like Naomi, like Ruth, we find ourselves destitute. We find ourselves outside of the family. We find ourselves separated from the body and from the company of God. We find that separation not by the death of a husband, but by our own sin. We find ourselves as outsiders when it comes to God. And in our journey to return home, we find that there is a challenge. Because we don't have the right to that inheritance. We don't have the standing to go before God and claim a place with him because of our sin, because of our shortcoming. What we need is, like Ruth and like Naomi, a redeemer. We need someone who gives us standing. We need someone who will take us and in our place stand and say, this is theirs. This belongs to them because they're mine. In Isaiah, he writes about that very phrase. He talks about not fearing because the Lord says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And he uses that word specifically. I have redeemed you. I have given you standing. I have made you whole. I have opened the door of access to the blessings of of the family. I brought you back in to be a part of God's people. Boaz was a redeemer for Ruth and Naomi, giving them standing where they had none and access to an inheritance that they otherwise would not have had because of the death of their husbands. Jesus is our redeemer because he stood in our place 
And because of His blood, we have standing. Because of His death, we have a voice before God saying, I, I know them. I will vouch for them. They're mine. I know their name. I've redeemed them. Here is your inheritance. We have a Boaz in Christ. And we all must strive to have the faithfulness of Ruth. Ruth did not abandon Naomi. In fact, she accepted the faith of Naomi went with her and created the opportunity for this redemption to take place. It would have been very easy for Ruth to just go back to her old land, to her old faith, and to her old culture, but she chose to stay with something <coughs> that was different because she had a sense of faithfulness and loyalty I don't know about her faith development and how she came to believe in the one true God and how all that evolved, but I would say Naomi must have had some kind of an influence on her for that to happen, for Ruth to be willing to follow her. And I think there's a great lesson there that we ought to be the kind of people who influence others for the Lord and we ought to be the kind of people who have a loyalty and a faithfulness to those around us that we will care for them and create opportunities for redemption for them. Because we have been called by name. We have been brought out of a foreign land, brought into a promised land, given an inheritance, given standing and given a voice because of the blood of Christ, because of the grace of God that sent him. Are you willing to accept it? Today, many in the religious world, many even in the secular world, will take time and recognize a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. Because God defeated death in that resurrection, but He defeated sin on the cross. The blood of Christ did away with Satan's power to consume us. Will you be faithful today? Will you be faithful to the one who has called you? Will you say to Jesus, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. When we give our lives to Christ, we give our lives up. We die to ourselves to be joined in a new life with God. Maybe that's what you need this morning. Maybe you're looking for that relationship with God. Maybe you need to be redeemed. Maybe you're looking for someone to stand with you and say, this is mine. They are mine. I've called them by name. If you need a redeemer, there is one for you. And just like Boaz, Christ will take you by the hand. Stand before the Lord and deliver an inheritance to you. If you're struggling with faithfulness, if you, you understand the relationship with God, if you have that bond, if you are a child of His, but you still struggle with the faithfulness, that's an everyday battle for all of us. And we will stand with you. We stand together. That's why we're a family. There are those who may need prayers, who may need encouragement, who may need to be told where you go, we will go. We're here with you the entire journey. If that's what you need to be told this morning, then that's the message that we offer. If you need to join with your Redeemer in the waters of baptism, that opportunity is available to you now as well. If there's something we can do for you this morning, we hope you make that known, whether publicly or privately. As we stand now and Benjamin leads us in song. <laughs> This world is not my home. I
Oh.